Well, over the weekend, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, introduced by Mitch McConnell at the Mitch McConnell Center or something, something that's named after him, uh, to a crowd of uh, right-wing Republicans, gives a speech about how important it is that the court not be seen as partisan. Right. What do we do about this? I mean, here we have a Supreme Court that was stacked and packed. Uh, Mitch McConnell, of course, forbade President Obama from putting his guy on, Merrick Garland, for f over 400 days, uh, you know, for a year, and then throws Amy Coney Barrett on before Ruth Bader Ginsburg is even in the ground. I mean, literally, um, at, you know, when it's just a, a couple of weeks before the election. Uh, this is... And, 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 and also, <laughs> with regard to, uh, to uh, Anthony Kennedy, there are credible stories out there that because Anthony Kennedy's son was the guy who signed off on a billion dollars worth of loans to Donald Trump and his organization, that Trump was essentially blackmailing Kennedy into leaving. Um, and I'm not uh, absolutely asserting that, but I think it's something that should be checked into. But in any case, we've got this court that has, that, that has just gone off the edge. What do we do about it? Megan Hatcher Mays is on the line with us. Megan is a lawyer and director of the, of the Democracy Policy for Indivisible.org. Um, important Megan is her Twitter handle and or Indivisible team. And Megan, uh, welcome back to the program. Uh, Roe v. Wade, I mean, you know, Texas is really making this clear for us what the impact of this is for because most people don't pay attention to most of what the Supreme Court does. Uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on how best America should respond to this? Yeah, uh, it's very funny to hear Amy Coney Barrett say that, uh, you know, oh, the court shouldn't be perceived as partisan. You know, there's obviously a role that justices play there and making sure people don't see it that way. Dave, as though they are partisan, yeah. which is what they are doing when they, you know, strike down, uh, effectively strike down Roe v. Wade uh, starting in Texas, but, you know, it won't stop there. So I think the first thing that Congress needs to do is, you know, codify Roe and do all that stuff, you know, pass a federal bill to protect uh, reproductive health care for women and people who can get pregnant. But this isn't going to stop. I mean, the whole reason that, uh, you know, there's six conservatives on the Supreme Court and the, the, these particular is because they want to overturn Roe versus Wade. So really the only solution at this point to fix the court, to restore balance to the court, is to add seats. We really do need to pass a bill that would um, add four seats uh, so that the outsized influence of the conservatives on the Supreme Court don't doesn't have a negative impact on all the rest of us. Right. And it's not like this hasn't been done before. John Adams shrank the court because he didn't want Thomas Jefferson, who was the incoming president, and these two guys, uh, they hadn't even spoken. I mean, Jefferson was Adams' vice president, but they had not spoken in two years because Jefferson was so upset about the Alien Sedition Act. Um, and uh, so Je Adams shrinks the court. Jefferson expands the court. Um, at, when Lincoln was assassinated, there was an opening on the court, and uh, the Republicans did not want the, the, the pro shall we say, the progressives of the era, did not want uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, you know, a, a right-wing Democrat and slave owner, to be able to add somebody to the court. And so they shrank the size of the court. And then as soon as he was out of the White House and uh, Ulysses Grant was in, they expanded the court again. Um, I mean, you know, we. Uh, so this isn't like it's, it's not like it's never, never happened before. Some of the pushback to let's expand, and, and of course Franklin Roosevelt tried it in 37, actually didn't try it, just talked about it. And that was enough to get mm -hmm. Justice Owen Roberts who was kind of the head of the four horsemen, you know, the guy who was preventing the court from, or was threatening to blow up Social Security and a lot of the rest of the New Deal, it got him to change his vote. Um, and there's, I mean, it's just, just, just an amazing story about how political pressure, uh, you know, uh, uh, Wikipedia notwithstanding, and, and a lot of the kind of revisionist history out there, uh, FDR had a hell of a lot of support for expanding the court back then. Um, but uh, he ultimately didn't have to because the court changed their positions. Um, a, do you think that that, you know, that a genuine threat could cause this court to wake up the way that the court did in 1937? I'm skeptical of that. Um, or, and B, <laughs> you know, the, the main um, objection to what you're suggestion, suggesting that I keep hearing in, in mainstream media is, oh yeah, uh, Democrats uh, expand the court by four people. And as soon as Republicans have power, they'll shrink the court by four people. And, you know, it's just... <laughs> 
you know, and I'm and I'm like, bring it on. But I'm wondering what you're thinking. Yeah, well, so for the first thing, I actually think you can kind of read Amy Coney Barrett's comments over the weekend as sort of a version of what happened in the 30s when FDR was kind of threatening to add seats to the court. Instead of, you know, them changing their minds, which I think you're right, is completely, like, pretty unlikely. I mean, the reason they were picked is because they are sure things. Their votes are a surefire bets uh, for, you know, conservatives. Uh, instead of them changing their minds, I think it's more likely that you'll see kind of what Amy Coney Barrett said, where it's like, what you're actually seeing is not happening. So kind of like a Trump-esque kind of gaslighting. So for her to say, oh, the court isn't partisan, it is, obviously. She knows that. And she knows that the six conservatives on the court are kind of ha- trying to help Republicans, either by chipping away at the Voting Rights Act or by overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, so she knows that. So I think that their new PR plan is to just pretend like that's not happening, to say, oh, you have nothing to worry about. The court is fine. It's not political. It's not partisan. And so it's up to us to just not believe that, just not believe her when she says things like that. But I think that's coming from a place of fear in the same way that, you know, that justice is changing their votes back uh, under FDR. They're afraid that um, if people notice what they're doing and get upset, then things will change. And if things change, that means they will lose a lot of their conservative power on the Supreme Court, which is why it's so important for progressives to be really pushing um, for expansion. It's, there's a bill pending in Congress as we speak to add four seats. You don't need a constitutional amendment to do it. You can do it through simple legislation. So... Which is, oh, if you get rid of it, then Republicans will get rid of it when they're in power again, and they'll undo everything that we did. And to that, I say, let's go ahead. Let them. Let's do good stuff now. And if Republicans want to undo all the good stuff that we did now, that's on them. But that shouldn't stop us from doing something good now while we have the chance. And right now, that means adding seats to the Supreme Court. Sure, they might retaliate, but Mitch McConnell already did that. I mean, the him holding open a seat for a year. He didn't need an excuse to do that. He just did it. He's a bad person who doesn't really need an excuse to do bad things. So we might as well um, take advantage of the trifecta that we've got, fix the courts, you know, fix our democracy, because right now the court is acting as a hindrance to democracy by gutting the Voting Rights Act and making it more difficult for people to vote. So we have to do something about that. Otherwise, you'll be kind of stuck in a feedback loop where uh, of minority control from the court to the presidency to the uh, legislative branch. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And and I feel the same way about the filibuster. You know, uh, people are, you know, oh, if you blow up the filibuster, then when Republicans have power, they'll do terrible things. I'm like, cool, let them do it. Let the people see what they actually <laughs> want. Like, you know, right now they're hiding behind the filibuster when Democrats are in control, you know, mm-hmm. or when they're in control and Democrats are filibustering them. You know, let's have democracy. We've been preaching it for 200 years. Let's actually have it in the United States Senate. But that's kind of a digression. Back to the Supreme Court. Article 3, Section 2 of the, of the Supreme Court clearly states that Congress not only can regulate the court, um, which has been interpreted to mean, you know, define the number of justices, uh, define the budget, define, you know, pay for the building where they meet, all that kind of stuff, Um, even set rules for the court, like, you know, uh, if Congress wanted to, they could require cameras in in the court, for example. Um, so So not only regulate the court, but also says that Congress can define exceptions, and that's the word they use in Article 3, Section 2, to what the court can do. And, you know, Jefferson was very outspoken about this, so, you know, was furious when Marbury versus Madison was passed, the whole concept of judicial review. But what I found fascinating, when I, I wrote a book on the Supreme Court about two years ago, and when I was doing the research on it, I found this memo from John Roberts back when he was working yeah. for Ronald Reagan. And he produced, Mm -hmm. Reagan gave him the job of figuring out how to reverse Roe v. Wade and and Brown v. Board without a constitutional amendment. And Roberts did a deep dive and cites literally dozens of Supreme Court cases that have acknowledged that exceptions clause and multiple pieces of legislation that have included it, but it has just never been subject to judicial review, where, uh, and, 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 and tells Reagan, here's what you do. You pass a law saying, uh, it, you know, Congress says segregated schools are okay and the court may not rule on this. Congress says abortion, states may make abortion illegal and the Supreme Court may not rule on this. And this will comport with Article 3, Section 2. It's called, called court stripping or jurisdiction stri- stripping. I'm guessing you're familiar with it as an attorney. And, and yep. I'm wondering if there is, you know, and I, I, I lay out Robert's uh, memo at some extensive length in my book. 
because he builds this really strong case for this. Um, Reagan ultimately <laughs> thought the political damage would be so great that he wouldn't do it. But is anybody talking about that? Um, it's so it's one of the reforms that I think is out there. I think it's not um, gotten as much attention as adding seats. I think it's a little bit of a double edged sword, right? So I think the reason why John Roberts wanted to uh, wanted to jurisdiction strip, if you will, strip the court of jurisdiction, uh, it was very specifically about abortion, uh, to, to my knowledge. And yes. the reason that he wanted to do that is because he wanted states to pass really bad, really restrictive abortion laws and make it so courts could not hear those cases. It basically, affect, like we're basically ending us up in the situation that we're in now, where it's kind of right. a race to the bottom right. as far as how restrictive these abortion laws can go. So it's, there's a flip. So on the one hand, you could say, you could strip the court of jurisdiction to say, hear any case that it was, or hear, uh, sorry, to hear a challenge to any law that was, say, passed under the Commerce Clause, which is like the main way that Congress passes laws. Mm -hmm. That way, you know, if Democrats were in charge, they could pass a really expansive social safety net and the court could not hear any challenges to it. The flip of that is that if you strip jurisdiction of for any law that, say, is like an anti-discrimination law and, and Republicans do a version of it where you can discriminate against LGBT people or black people or people of right. color, that would not be sub subject to judicial review either. Well, so it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. I think it's a very interesting concept. Yeah, it is. Uh, but and it's not one that's gotten a ton of attention. Yeah, forgive my interruption. I just see I, I, we're going to hit a break in 30 seconds. I can't control. Um, <laughs> when George Mason presented that to Thomas Jefferson and said, what about that scenario? Who should decide what is and isn't constitutional? if not the Supreme Court, Jefferson's response was the people themselves, which is why Larry Kramer, the dean of the, of the Stanford Law School, titled his book, The People Themselves, in which he argued against judicial review. Yeah. So it, I, I think it's really a really interesting idea. It's hard to imagine since it's been you know hundreds of years, but yeah. anything's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty yeah. much anything would be an improvement over what we've got now. <laughs> Overturn 200 years of precedent. Anyhow, Megan Hatcher Mays, a lawyer and director of the Democracy of Democracy Policy for Indivisible.org. Important Megan and Indivisible team over on Twitter. Megan, great talking with you again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom.